Good night. Hey, sir. Thank you so much for appearing today. I really appreciate it. I want to tell you about how my friends, neighbors in Tomball, Spring, Texas, and of course, Americans across this country are feeling today after listening to this. They feel that we have a two-tiered justice system in this country, and it's terrifying. So I applaud your work. I actually find you to be sincere in working on behalf of the American people, and I recognize that. Um, but I also feel like we need to hold the people accountable who have participated in the sham of an investigation. I'm going to tell you why. What happened in 2016 was unprecedented. The same government agencies that were investigating President Trump and his campaign were looking the other way when it came to the allegations against the Clintons. In the same time, the Clinton campaign paid for the Steele dossier, the DOJ and FBI were helping to cover up Clinton's crimes. We know this to be a fact. 33,000 emails miraculously disappeared. Phones were smashed with hammers by the FBI. Even CNN fact-checked this, and it turned out to be true. Yes, CNN. And they refused to prosecute her. This selective prosecution doesn't only favor the Clintons, though, as we have seen in very recent history. Sir, I'm sure you are familiar with what's going on with Hunter Biden's plea deal and his refusal to pay his taxes and the separate agreement to dismiss his felony gun possession, both of which were announced yesterday. You familiar with that, sir? Yes. Hunter Biden will likely serve no jail time for his offenses, and, and yet there was no early morning SWAT raid on Hunter's home in coordination with the media either. The American people are sick and tired of this two-tiered justice system, and as a black man, I'm tired of seeing this kind of discretion used to favor people like Hunter Biden because he's white and a son of a president. While Hunter Biden will serve no jail time for these charges, black men across this country are in prison for years for the exact same crimes, and I'm not surprised because I guess this selective justice shouldn't become as a surprise to anyone in this room, because after all, Joe Biden was one of the authors of the 94 crime bill, one of my all-time favorites. And we could see what that has done to black men across this country. But back to this report. This report concerns one of many investigations into Trump that led absolutely nowhere, wasted vast amounts of resources and time, and spread lies, rumors, and innuendos about Trump across this country. What we know is that the Clinton campaign and the DNC paid for the Steele dossier, which was used as a basis for the FISA warrants to spy on an incoming president. Correct, sir? It was paid, much of that, the dossier was paid for from the campaign uh, through Bob Perkins, uh, Cooey's hiring of Fusion and Fusion's hiring of Steel. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, sir. The biggest problem that I have with that is that none of the, none of the significance has been prosecuted over this sham investigation, and, and no one who participated in this investigation is serving any jail time today. I think we've kind of heard that resonate throughout the halls of this room today. But meanwhile, the DOJ, the same agency that is responsible for this phony investigation in 2016, is at this very moment seeking to put Donald Trump in prison for over 400 years over a document issue. And last I checked, President Biden has a bit of a document issue himself before he was even the sitting president of this country. And again, it's another example of this two-tier justice system. My colleagues on the left talk about democracy. Well, here's what I know about democracy. In 2016, Donald Trump was elected by the American people to be their commander in chief. But he wasn't allowed to serve in that capacity because he and his administration spent four years responding to Democrat invented scandal after Democrat invented scandal. And here we are, seven years later, still talking about President Trump and this Democrat invented scandal. And this does not look like a democracy to me. As a West Point graduate and combat veteran, I've fought abroad against authoritarian countries. I know what they look like, and I know what, the, what those countries do and how they treat their people, and I also know what democracy looks like. And my fear <clears throat> is that this looks like the death of democracy, and it's up to us in this room to do something about it. Sir, I cannot thank you very much for your time. Thank you for hanging in there. I really appreciate it. I yield back the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Durham, did you see evidence of collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign in 2016? No. So the American public that has been um, told this hoax for years, 
It was just that, a hoax. Is that correct? Our investigation showed that there were a lot of failures in the FBI and how they did this investigation that did not disclose or reveal information uh, or evidence concerning any conspiracy or collusion between Mr. Trump and Russian authorities. Um, by the way, I hope you'll give me a full five minutes, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, are you familiar um, with the January 5th, 2017 meeting that ha was held in the White House? Uh, President Obama was there. Vice President Biden was there. Susan Rice was there and others. Are you familiar with that meeting? I know that that meeting occurred. Um, do you know that uh, FBI Director James Comey was there? That's my understanding. Um, did you get access or try to get access to uh, Director Comey's notes? Um, we reviewed, yeah, in connection with our inquiry, we looked at um, phone records, notes, those sorts of things. I don't, I don't recall seeing any notes of uh, Mr. Comey's from, from that meeting. They could exist, but I don't recall having seen them. So as special counsel, you were authorized to investigate whether any federal official employer or any other person violated the law in connection with individuals associated with campaigns and individuals with the administration, including Crossfire Hurricane. Did you think this wasn't relevant to go after these notes? I mean, January 5th, 2017, we're in the process of the transition. Um, weren't you um, um, inquisitive about that? Yeah, as I, as I say, I don't know. We had um, sought from the FBI uh, all such records. What I can't tell you is that uh, there were any records. That, that's what I'm saying. Could you repeat that last answer? Sure. Uh, when um, I think as we re um, set out in the report, the Bureau produced in excess of, uh, I think it was uh, 6,800,000 pages of records that were reviewed. Among the records that we sought from the FBI uh, were relevant um, notes, records, uh, uh, telephone records, and the like. What I can't tell you is whether, and Mr. Comey uh, being one of them, um, what I can't tell you, because I just don't know, is whether or not there were notes of Mr. Comey's from that, uh, from that meeting. Are you aware that in 2017, prior to the Department of Justice filing a motion to dismiss the case against General Flynn, they interviewed Mr. Priestap? Um, yes. During that interview, the Department of Justice found Mr. Priestap's notes, which suggested that the FBI was trying to entrap Mr. Flynn. Why didn't you, um, why didn't you interview Mr. Priestap? With Why do you think it wasn't relevant to subpoena Mr. Priestap to gather information on his involvement with Crossfire Hurricane, especially the Attorney General at the time said they were trying to lay a perjury trap for Mr. Flynn? Sure. So as uh, relates specifically to uh, Mr. Priestap, and I, this reflected in the report, uh, Mr. Priestap did agree to talk to us with regard to the Alpha Bank matter. So we interviewed him um, uh, on that matter. He was not willing to talk uh, beyond that. Um, as previously indicated, um, we were disappointed with some of these decisions on the part of high-ranking members of the FBI not to cooperate as, as you are. Uh, but there are reasons. You have to, when, if you're going to subpoena somebody to the grand jury, um, which is one of the more powerful tools that you have, you've got to look at a number of factors to determine whether or not it's appropriate, whether it makes sense, whether it be productive. And in, in this case, not speaking to um, Mr. Priestep's situation, um, alone, but one of the decisions was, okay, does Pre-Step have information that would be relevant or is likely to be relevant to the matter, criminal matters, not the general inquiry into what happened in the investigation of the campaign, but the criminal matters the grand jury is looking at or not? Mr. Durham, I only, ha I only have 30 seconds here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we're very disappointed also. I keep hearing this term disappointed all day long. Let's sum it up. Vice President Biden and President Obama knew about it. Hillary fabricated it, the FBI orchestrated it, and the media sold it to the public, and it's still out there. The question is, who watches the watchmen? The FBI has become a Praetorian guard here, protecting the nation's capital, but not the people of the United States of America. It is going to be up to us as Republicans, and solely us as Republicans, starting on this Judiciary Committee, to get accountability to the FBI in the United States of America. 
Gentleman yields back. Uh, I, I apologize, Mr. Durham, but we are going to have to. I apologize, my colleagues. I was wanting to get this done before votes, and we've been working with the floor, but unfortunately, they've called them. Uh, so we're going to recess. It'll probably be 30 minutes, more or less, um, and then we'll we'll come back, and you can obviously make yourself comfortable back in the in, in, in the area. Then again, I apologize. Our our team here was hoping to get able to get through that. We'll be back in approximately half an hour. Committee stands in recess.